Thank you. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the department and to the uh, February Fourier talks. The, we're very proud, in the department, we're very proud of the center. It was founded in 2004. And the center is interdisciplinary and it provides links to a number of parts of campus, which is a particularly special strength. And it, this includes to the Clark School of Engineering, which is very important to us. The members, so the f four members of the center are very busy. Between them, there's now 10 PhD students and three postdocs. And the um, Center also serves another purpose I want to comment on, and that is the center's part of the department's strategic plan to keep John from retiring. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, John and Kathy, I just got off the phone with Jim, and he explained that three years ago, to close our budget gap, he spent your entire retirement account. <laughs> So, John, we're going to be working together for quite a while. He's building up again. <laughs> so, everyone enjoy the conference, and now back to John. So, well, that's the reason Jim was not invited tonight. <laughs> so, you have to. Uh, thank you. The. Um, excuse me. You have to suffer through a little advertisement for the Norbert Wiener Center, uh, and then you hear a really interesting talk by Mark Stopfer from NIH. So the uh, Norbert Wiener Center was founded uh, in 2004, but in fact, uh, there was this wonderful idea that uh, Wojtek Shire, who's now part of our center, had before that when he was a postdoc, to have the February Fourier talks. Now, Shire is not perfect. It should have been the fall Fourier talks, but in any case, there you go. Uh, I, Norbert Wiener was one of my heroes. Uh, when I was a graduate student, he uh, <coughs> was a professor down the river from where I was going to graduate school. Uh, I never met him, but uh, my professor certainly talked about his work, and I learned so much about his work on Tiberian theorems and generalized harmonic analysis at this other place I was at. <coughs> uh, the Norbert Wiener Center Department of Mathema is in the Department of Mathematics by my choice and uh, with the blessing of uh, the chair at the time, Mike Fitzpatrick. And I wanted it that way because Norbert Wiener himself, for all of his interdisciplinary activities, stayed in the Department of Mathematics at MIT. Uh, we like to think of ourselves uh, as being a state-of-the-art research center. We also feel that we have a leading edge in educational ideas and implementation and an international center which I will allude to by what I mean by that but certainly there are several centers of harmonic analysis throughout the country and world and I hope that we are part of that group. Uh, our mission, and in fact the original idea we had, was to advance research in mathematical engineering, of which I know nothing about engineering, but I understood its importance and its relationship to mathematics. Advance research in mathematical engineering in the 21st century, analogous to mathematical physics of the 20th century. This I found was fundamental. In fact, growing up in a place like the University of Maryland's mathematics department, one saw the uh, power and importance of uh, partial differential equations, numerical work in partial differential equations that was brought upon us and became a part of mathematics departments because of the wonderful work done in uh, physics in the 19th century. And with the golden, what I view as the golden age of image processing and uh, speech processing and uh, signal processing in general in the late 20th century and in the present time, it seemed to me that we should have a position in mathematics departments to provide mathematical input to this wonderful blossoming 
of ideas that was going on in the, in the engineering community. Uh, we have been involved in all of these activities here. Uh, in biomathematics and in medical imaging and diagnostics, we have excellent connections with NIH. Uh, with all the standard things in uh, signal and image processing and waveform design. More recently in opportunistic sensing with the Army. Non-uniform sampling is one of our staples. In the present, there's compressed sensing and also in the present machine learning. Uh, quantum measurement and detection. Anyhow, these are part of our toolkit and part of the people that we would like to serve and hope we can serve well and in a creative way. Uh, the present structure of the center is as follows. We're a small, but I think excellent group. Uh, the, uh, besides myself, uh, Travis Andrews is our assistant director and uh, I, he, anything good that happens at this conference is due to him. Uh, now, if he's not in the room, I hope the microphone's working so he heard that in the other room, but, uh, but it's true. Uh, we have this notion of having scientific development officers. The idea is to have these folks uh, reach out to the applied community and to uh, secure relationships between them and us. And we're very, very fortunate to have really three outstanding people, uh, Drs. Mike DeLomo, Jeff Siraki, and Navatadella, Alfredo Navatadella. They are all very experienced, all uh, in, in applied mathematics with lots of really applicable work under their belt. Uh, our faculty members are uh, Radu Balan, Wojtek Shaya, and Kaso Okuju. And uh, they really are uh, not only staples, but excellence uh, in, in the highest form. And we are so fortunate to have our postdoctoral fellows. Uh, I can say Shumei Shen, I can say Ben Manning, I can say Julia. And as much as I try in public, I would get nervous and blow, you know, not too well with Julia's name, last name. But uh, th this is an outstanding group, and th this is more or less typical. They, they will move on. And uh, in fact, Julia is moving on this coming year to a, a very nice position. And we, this is more or less our, 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 our structure. To talk about our research briefly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we want to do theoretical and applicable harmonic analysis and, and to support the technologies of the 21st century. Whoops, excuse me. And our <coughs> one of our goals in order to sustain ourselves is to uh, achieve grants. We are a self-reliant organization within the mathematics department. Uh, in, in the sense that we all receive our salaries, but we have to reach out for grants. And uh, we've been very, very fortunate in recent years to uh, not only get grants from uh, DOD in general, and NIH and NSF, but uh, with industry, with MITRE and Siemens. And uh, before the, uh, the bust of the uh, real estate market, with State Street Bank. Uh, we had nothing to do with that bus, though. So, so. <laughs> as far as education goes, uh, we provide, I think, excellent student opportunities. Uh, Scott mentioned correctly we have about 10 PhD students at the present time, but that's been the status quo in the sense that we have been very, very fortunate to have outstanding students come to us, and we get them out. We usually get them jobs. Uh, in fact, almost always we get them jobs, and uh, we get new students. We have got a, a wonderfully highly talented group of, uh, of graduate students. We also have uh, undergraduate fellowships. We name it after Daniel Sweet, who was one of our outstanding uh, educators who unfortunately passed away much too young. We uh, have what we call research interaction teams, and these range from very applied subjects in data analysis on hyperspectral to very abstract topics about trying to solve Chris Hiles HRT conjecture. And we always have quite a few of them going on. And we have student conference participation and lots of topics courses. I just numbered, uh, mentioned a few of them here, but uh, at the University of Maryland, topics courses are, are our advanced graduate courses and we have lots of them and our students really, I think, they're 
do very well taking them. As an international center, what I mean by that is, I mean everyone's international, right? Uh, but uh, besides this conference, we also have an annual conference on biomedical image analysis. We have lots and lots of collaborations because of these links that Scott mentioned, not only within the university but outside the university. Uh, we've got a waveform repository. We've done a lot of work in waveform design and we continue to do that. Uh, our website is actually a, a very informative uh, website as far as what's going on in the world of applied harmonic analysis. Uh, as you might have noticed across the hall during the day, uh, we uh, have uh, Springer Burkhäuser represented. We've got uh, excellent relations with Springer Burkhäuser. We not only are fundamental to the Journal of Fourier Analysis and Applications, uh, but also to the Applied and Numerical Harmonic Analysis book series. And with regard to that, I want to mention that uh, besides looking at the books, and if you want to buy some, buy some, uh, but we, two of the books out there uh, reflect, two of the volumes, reflect uh, publications of this particular conference <coughs> since we began in 2006. And they're called Excursions in Harmonic Analysis from the February Fourier Talks, and the Volumes 1 and 2, and Volume 3 is uh, going to be in the works, hopefully with participants from this year and last year, and uh, we hope to continue that particular uh, series. Uh, we have advisory boards. Uh, uh, we've had, we have top-of-the-line academics. We're very fortunate to have Ingrid with us now, but she's been with us as an academic member for member of our advisory board for a number of years, and Rafi Koifman from Yale, and Margaret Cheney, who is now at Colorado State, formerly of Rensselaer, and, and Guido Weiss. And our government and industrial board uh, consists of Greg Coxon at NRL, and Mike DeLomo of Radon, who's here, Glenn Easley of MITRE, Gary Jason of MITRE, uh, Joe Lawrence, formerly of ONR, who now has a very prestigious position uh, in the government, uh, Harry Schmidt, who is here, Jeff Siraki, who I don't think is here, and uh, uh, Fran Sullivan, who runs the computer center associated with NSA. And uh, presently, our advisory board within the university consists of uh, Mike Fitzpatrick, who began, uh, the, was part and parcel of the beginning of the Nobuina Center, as was Stephen Treder in engineering, Constantina Treviser of uh, AMSC, and Jim York, our present chair and soon to be uh, Scott Walpert. There is our hero, and, uh, and now uh, that's the end of the cell. <laughs> and so the uh, next part of this is uh, what I'm told is a very interesting talk by uh, Mark Stopfer from NIH. Mark? You have to tie this to yourself somehow. So. I'm not sure if I can help. If I can, I shall. <laughs> I'll just clip it up here. Well, thank you very much, John. And thank you, Wojciech. Thank you, uh, Travis. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to be uh, speaking to this meeting. Uh, I'm a biologist with very little um, to no mathematical background, but I found that I, I've come to rely very heavily on mathematicians for the work that we do in biology. Uh, some of you might have met um, Zane Aldworth, who's a, a postdoc in my group. He presented a poster this afternoon. And I, I rely very strongly on people like Zane, uh, who have good math backgrounds. And so it's a pleasure to be in a, a room full of people uh, who have that sort of background that I found to be so important. Um, so. All animals have to know what's going on in, in the world around them. And one of the things that the nervous system does is to bring the outside world inside. Uh, there are, the nervous system has evolved 
to capture information from the environment and form a representation of that information in the brain. And then the animal can act appropriately on that information, either forming a memory or, a, or generating a behavior. Uh, but it's important to get the information right. And so how does that happen? How does the information move uh, through the nervous system? Um, specifically, what I'm going to talk about today is what, what form does the information take? Uh, it's not just a photograph of what's out there making its way in, into the back of the brain where a little person or a little moth looks at the photograph. Uh, the information actually has to change formats as it moves from point to point. And what mechanisms determine the format that the information takes as it moves through the brain? These are the sort of questions that we're interested in. We've been using a simple systems approach. So we use relatively simple animals, uh, insects. These animals have experimental advantages. Uh, they have fewer neurons than we do, and so that makes it easier to, uh, to test specific questions about what the groups of neurons are doing. Um, we're able to easily work with intact, fully awake animals. Because we're working with insects, we don't have to worry about anesthesia. We don't, we don't have to basically follow NIH protocols that, uh, that apply to vertebrates. Um, and sometimes I feel guilty about that and sometimes not. Uh, we work with, with moths and with flies and with locusts. And because we're working with these relatively simple animals, it's possible to do a real point-by-point -point analysis of where the information is moving. By that I mean we can start at the periphery and record from the receptors themselves, and then we can look at the interneurons that follow directly from those receptors and see what they're doing with that information. And then we can look at the neurons that are immediately following from those cells, and so on. We can go point to point and see how the information is, is transforming as it makes its way through. And so far we've been focusing mostly on the periphery, but we're slowly working our way uh, deeper into the brain. Uh, we've also been focusing on the chemical senses uh, of olfaction and taste. And uh, in the insect, um, olfaction is achieved mainly through the antenna. Uh, taste is achieved mainly through mouth parts, such as the proboscis. Um, I know dinner is coming up, so you might be able to keep some of these thoughts in mind as you en en enjoy the meal. Uh, but the chemical senses are really challenging from an information processing perspective, and that's because uh, the chemical world is very high dimensional. It's a complicated environment. If you think about vision or audition, uh, the basic stimuli of light and, and sound can be decomposed into two basic dimensions of uh, intensity and frequency. Uh, but there's no really simple way to decompose the um, characteristics of the molecules that make up the taste and, and olfactory world. Uh, these molecules, which number in, in the tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands, come in all different shapes and sizes. They have different length carbon backbones, they have different, uh, different functional moieties, uh, they have different charge distributions, they can wiggle and move in different ways. And just coming up with a description of this really complicated environment is a difficult task. And that's what drew me uh, to be, be interested in trying to understand how the brain achieves that, how it comes up with a description of what's out there. Um, so this high dimensionality of the environment is, is something that's of great interest. Uh, the insect olfactory anatomy, and I, I'm going to, most of my talk will be about olfaction, and in the end I'm going to throw in some very, very new stuff about the gustatory system that we're just beginning to work on. Um, but the olfactory system of the insect is actually surprisingly similar to our own olfactory system in, in many ways. It really seems like there's one best way to achieve olfaction, and it's evolved again and again and again through the course of evolution. Uh, there's always a lot of receptors out in the periphery, and in the insect, as I mentioned, mostly those are on the antenna. They can be on other body parts, too. And they project into this first uh, brain area, which in the insect is called the antennal lobe. In our brains, it's called the olfactory bulb. Um, and here there's two main types of neurons. There are these excitatory projection neurons. Uh, they're called projection neurons because these are the cells that project out to other parts of the brain. And they provide the only conduit for olfactory information that, that moves deeper into the brain. Uh, in our brains, these are called mitral cells and tufted cells. Uh, there's another class of cells called local neurons. Most of these are inhibitory, uh, though some of them are excitatory too. In our brains, they're called juxtaglomerular cells. And these different types of cells actually perform very similar functions in both vertebrates and in insects. And you'll notice that the olfactory receptors, which are excitatory, 
provide information out onto the projection neurons and onto the local neurons. And the local neurons interact with each other, and they also interact with the projection neurons. They send inhibition to them. And the projection neurons send excitation back to the local neurons in addition to providing output to other brain areas. So it's an interesting little circuit, and it does a bunch of really interesting things. You can make recordings from different places in the brain in different ways. Uh, you can place electrodes inside the cells. The cells, of course, are communicating by transmitting pulses of electricity to each other. So you can make voltage records of their activity that way. Um, another way you can make recordings from them is to take a big blunt electrode uh, that records not the activity of one cell, but the activity of a whole population of cells. The, cell, the electrode is large enough and blunt enough that it's picking up a whole field of electrical activity. And when you place the electrode here in an area called the mushroom body, because under the microscope it actually looks like a mushroom, uh, you pick up the activity of the whole population of projection neurons. And this is what it looks like under ordinary conditions. You just see kind of a noisy, basically flat line of activity uh, when there's no particular stimulus on the antenna. But when you puff an odorant onto the antenna, something really dramatic happens. Suddenly, this flat uh, field potential begins to oscillate. You see this very regular sinusoidal response. And this astonished me the first time I, I saw this in the laboratory. This type of oscillatory response is the signature that a whole population of cells has suddenly become synchronized. And the population of cells that synchronized are, are these projection neurons. And they've become synchronized by this circuit interaction. Now, we were certainly not the first people to see oscillatory synchronization in, in our olfactory system. It was observed back in the 40s uh, by Adrian, uh, who was working in the hedgehog. Why the hedgehog? It just happens to have a really, really big olfactory bulb. So it was a good model system for studying olfaction at the time. And this is an ancient mercury column recording uh, showing oscillations in the olfactory bulb of, of the hedgehog. And we see the same thing in basically every animal that, that's ever been tested. In our, in our laboratory, we've seen it in every insect you could think of, uh, or every insect we could catch, basically. Um, it's been, it certainly occurs in our brains. It occurs in snakes and lizards. It seems to be a, a fundamental part of processing olfactory information. And of course, we see it in our, in our insects. Uh, we've been studying this process for, for, for some years, and we have a good understanding of how this circuitry generates these oscillations. Uh, this is a simultaneous recording of the field potential uh, from the mushroom body. Um, plus a recording, intracellular recording from a projection neuron, uh, plus an intracellular recording from a local neuron. And you can see that there's this regular phasic interaction among the components. Um, it's cyclic, so you can jump in anywhere, but I'll, I'll start with the local neuron. So the local neurons are receiving excitation from the antenna, and so the local neuron wants to spike. It's being excited, so it wants to spike. And this is what a spike looks like in a local neuron. And right after that, you see there's this bit of inhibition coming down away from spiking in the projection neuron. And that's because of this inhibitory connection that we know about. We can see it in, in the animal's anatomy. But as soon as that inhibition wears off, then the projection neuron can spike. And we know it wants to spike because it's also getting excitation from the antenna. It, it's receiving drive from odorants. And then shortly after that, you see this peak in the field potential oscillation. And the delay between the spike and the PN and the peak in the field potential is just the conduction delay from here to here. That's how long it takes the signal to move through the axons. And then the cycle repeats itself. Um, and so this is how, it's basically a half center. This is how oscillations are generated. And this is happening in our brains too, uh, if, you're, if you're smelling something. I mean, excuse me. So why, why does this matter? Why is this important? Well. This mechanism forces a tendency for spikes to occur at a particular phase position. Like you can see here, they tend to occur just before the peak of the field potential. Um, and they, spikes can occur in other phase positions too. Uh, this mechanism sort of favors this, this uh, peak position, but spikes can occur in other positions also. Um, but there's another piece of the circuitry that I haven't told you about yet. Uh, in addition to receiving output of the projection neurons, these Kenyan cells, which are reading the output of this bit of circuitry, are also getting uh, input from another type of cell. Um, it's this gigantic GABAergic interneuron. It's called the giant GABAergic interneuron, or, or GGN. And this is just one huge cell. Uh, a GABA is an inhibitory transmitter, and it provides inhibition back onto the Kenyan cells. It receives excitation from all of the Kenyan cells, and then provides inhibition back. And so you can imagine the Kenyan cells are getting these 
cyclic waves of excitation coming out of the antenna lobe, and this cell converts that into slightly delayed waves of inhibition that are opposing the excitation, but after a short delay, uh, coming out of the PNs. And so these Kenyan cells are integrating those two time-delayed inputs, and the result of that is that the Kenyans are, are unable to fire except for a very brief period uh, during each oscillatory cycle. So these Kenyan cells are exquisitely sensitive to timing. Timing is incredibly important, and that's not something that was intuitive to me about the sense of smell, but that timing in the spiking of these cells is really, really important. So where else do we see information about timing in this system? Oh, I want to mention that these oscillations really do matter. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, inhibi inhibition from the neurotransmitter GABA plays an important role in this circuit. Uh, there's a drug called picrotoxin that can block the effects of GABA. And when you inject picrotoxin into the antenna lobe, you can selectively desynchronize uh, the processing of information in the brain. And when you do that to a poor honeybee, it suddenly starts to have some difficulty telling one odorant from another. If you inject saline, it has no trouble distinguishing one odor from another, but if you inject picrotoxin, it starts to have trouble distinguishing odors that have similar molecular structures. So the oscillations and the precise synchrony really, really does matter. Historically, people have focused on the responses of the projection neurons because, as I mentioned, this is the only pathway of information to the rest of the brain about olfactory information. Um, what do you see in the responses? If you put an electrode into a projection neuron, uh, you can record the voltage records, and one thing that you notice immediately is that for a very simple square pulse of odor, the response of the cell is really complicated. It's got a really complicated temporal structure. It's not a simple burst of spikes. There's, in, in this particular cell, treated with this particular odor, the response is a little spike at the beginning and then a period of inhibition and then another burst of spikes and then a sort of a quiescent period and then a long burst of spikes and then another period of inhibition and then maybe after that it, it goes back to its baseline rest response. And you'll see this, this type of response over and over and over when you present that odor. So it's a really complicated response in which timing seems to play a role. And we believe the timing comes out of the circuitry. That's something I'll talk about a bit later on. So where do we see information about the outside world in the firing patterns of these cells? Well, I'm going to show you a series of recordings all made from one projection neuron, but challenged with different odorants. Um, so in this case, the, this gray part in the center here is a one second presentation of odor. Um, and this is the response of this cell, uh, of, of one cell, uh, to a presentation of uh, mint which is just a, an odorant we got from the supermarket. It's, it's not a pure odorant, it's just a blend, something that an animal might experience in nature at a, at a particular concentration. And you can see the cell responds by becoming a little bit inhibited, and then afterwards it fires this burst of spikes. And the response is very, very reliable. Time after time, you'll see the same pattern of activity. Now, what happens if you change the odorant? Still recording from the same cell. Well, the cell responds to this other odorant too but the timing of the response is totally different. Now there's this burst of spikes in the beginning and there's this period of inhibition at the end. And if you count up the number of spikes, the number of spikes is basically the same. It's the timing that changed. So what if you change the concentration of the odor? Well, what happens is that the timing changes. So the cell continues to respond, but now there's a little bit of a delay and, uh, it, in, in the burst of spikes. Total number of spikes is really not that different. And if you increase the concentration, Again, the timing changes. Now the period of inhibition is right in the middle. So this would seem to be a really confusing state of affairs uh, for, for downstream cells. How are they going to figure out what the odor is, given the complexity and the, the diversity of timing responses that these cells are generating? Well, apparently, it's an ensemble code that the downstream cells are looking at more than one cell in order to know what the odor is. So, oh, and this is just to show that the total number of spikes uh, in a large sample of, of 117 cells uh, for three different odorants, the total number of spikes um, across a wide range of concentrations is, is, is basically the same. These three odorants are geraniol, hexanol, and octanol. They're all volatiles that are released by grass. Uh, they basically all smell a little bit like a freshly mown lawn. So that's something that a, a locust, for example, would be very happy to, to, to detect. detect. So how can we analyze a, a complicated data set like this? Um, 
I'm sure people in this room could come up with a hundred ways to do it that would be really clever and, and would extract a lot of information. Um, our motivation was to try to think about the way the animal might be extracting the information. How is the animal's own nervous system looking at this data set? So I'm, first I'm going to show a little cartoon just to illustrate the principle of our analysis and then I'm going to tie it uh, more closely to the actual data set that we, that we had. So here's the little cartoon. I, imagine that you can record from three projection neurons simultaneously um, and then deliver a pulse of odorant and the first projection neuron responds this way, the second one like that, the third one like that. that this all happens simultaneously. Um, so to do the analysis, um, you rasterize them, you, you, just, you look only at the timing of the spikes, and then divide the response into a number of bins, and then just count the number of spikes that occur in each bin. And then you can make a graph uh, based on those numbers that, that you've counted. So, for example, the first point becomes, the first point in time becomes a point on the graph, the second point in time becomes another point on the graph, and so on. And in this way, you can construct a trajectory graph that, that gives you a picture of how this little population of three cells is responding over time. So, I'm not sure, so this probably wouldn't be too useful uh, because the, the time, the division of uh, uh, into bins was done arbitrarily. Uh, basically, I chose three because it's easy to make a three-dimensional graph. Um, and, but, but how can we apply this sort of analysis to, the, to what we know about the way the animal processes information? So what do we know about the way the Kenyan cells, for example, are analyzing the output of the projection neurons? Well, we know that, that every Kenyan cell is listening to more than 100 projection neurons. So we know that from anatomical studies. Uh, each Kenyan cell is getting input from more than 100 PNs. Um, and we know that the Kenyan cells are not integrating over long stretches of time. They're only looking in these short 50 millisecond bins because every 50 milliseconds they get this really strong inhibitory pulse that makes it impossible for, the, for them to integrate uh, over longer time periods. So let's take this information <coughs> about the number of inputs that they're getting and about the period of time over which they're integrating and use that to analyze our data set. So here's what we did. We recorded from a, a large number of projection neurons and here's a, a, a sample of the types of responses that we saw, recorded from 117 in all. And then we divided them up into bins and the bins was based on the timing of the field potential because we know that's what matters to the Kenyan cells. And then having divided them up, very simply, we just counted the number of spikes in each bin, and that gave us this high dimensional vector representation of the way this population of cells responds over time. Now there's a lot of redundancy in this data set, um, which, which you can show analytically, uh, or you can actually just see it in the responses of the cells. And so we did um, dimensionality reduction. We found that it actually, the data set is actually eight dimensional. It, it, it takes eight dimensions to capture most of the information in, in the data set. Uh, but for the purpose of illustration today, um, I'm just going to use three dimensions. Even with the newest version of PowerPoint, it's really hard to make an eight dimensional <laughs> display graph. Um, and so basically, this is what it looks like when you present an odor. At first, the response kind of bobbles around spontaneously, and then it moves through its response space, and then goes back to baseline uh, when the response is all over. And there are characteristic portions of this response that you see again and again. Uh, there's this bouncing around in the rest point, that's just spontaneous activity before the odor comes on. Um, then you see what, what's been called a fixed point, I guess an attractor would be a more a uh, proper dynamical systems term, but it's a point where um, the response is no longer moving through, it's, it's kind of settled into a particular point. And this happens because when you look at the uh, individual neurons that are contributing to the ensemble response, after a certain period of time, they just lock up or lock down. Uh, so they go through these complicated periods of activity for about two seconds, and then after two seconds, if the odor pulse is longer than that, then a given cell will either just start firing and continue firing until the end of the response, or it'll just be inhibited to the end of the response. So there's a dynamical period in the beginning and a dynamical period at the end, but in between, if the odor is long enough, you just get into this fixed point where there's no longer any dynamical uh, changing in, in the pattern of individual projection neurons or in the ensemble as a whole. And I'm going to come back to this idea of a fixed point later on in my talk. Now, if you change the concentration of the odor, um, then the trajectory, if it's the same odor, the same chemical odor, 
the trajectory goes into the same direction in the response space, but if it's a lower concentration, then the excursion is, sh is shorter. If it's a higher concentration, then it remains on the same manifold, but the excursion is, is further. And if you change the identity of the, of the odorant, so now it's a different chemical, uh, now the, uh, the response goes off in a completely different direction of response space. And so this is just a way to visualize um, how the, the whole system is responding over time and compare the responses from one to another. And of course all of this is a cartoon, but this is real data. This is recorded from the 117 cells uh, for the three different odorants that I mentioned before at, at five different concentrations. And you can see here for uh, hexanol, for example, um, you can see that the highest concentration makes the longest excursion. Lower concentrations are on the same manifold but going in the same direction. Different odorants go off in different directions. And so you can just see kind of intuitively how the Kenyan cells looking at the data set can distinguish one odor from, a diff from an another even though individual projection neurons are going to have ambiguous responses about what the odor is and what the concentration is, if you step back and look at the whole population the way the Kenyan cells do, then you can very easily classify. And in our analyses, you can classify easily to over 90% accuracy, uh, even for you know, 117 cells, and the animal has more than 800 of them. Excuse me. <coughs> So where do these spiking patterns come from? Uh, one of the interests that we have is, is understanding mechanism. Uh, where, how do these patterns arise in the olfactory system? Well, we always thought that, that these periods of excitation and inhibition came about through interactions within the antenna lobe. We thought that it was just these inhibition coming from the local neurons and excitation coming from the projection neurons and their interactions that led to these patterns of activity. Um, I mentioned that there's this very fast form of inhibition that causes the oscillations, but there's also a slow form of inhibition. It's mediated by a different receptor, uh, which causes very long, slow periods of inhibition. So the local neurons can be responsible for both the very fast uh, oscillation-causing inhibition and the slower inhibition that's, that's behind these patterns. So we, we thought this circuitry was responsible for generating the patterning. Um, but a few years ago, some postdocs in my group did a very simple experiment. Y you would think that if the circuitry is entirely responsible for generating the patterning, then if you give a very simple square pulse of electricity, say, to the antenna, then that should also kick off some, some very interesting patterning in the antenna lobe. So they tried that. And they found that they could get responses from projection neurons when they gave a shock to the antenna, but they were never interesting. You know, they were, we would see a burst of spikes, uh, sometimes a burst of spikes followed by a little bit of inhibition, but we never saw anything approaching the complexity or the duration of the type of response that you see when you deliver an odorant. So something, something is missing um, from our understanding of where these patterns were coming from. And very recently, a, a postdoc in my group, Joby Joseph, figured out how to make recordings uh, from the receptor neurons in the antenna. So th these locusts are solitary desert animals. They, they live in, in the dryness of the desert, and olfactory receptors have to exist within an aqueous milieu. That's why your nose is always running. It's because the, the olfactory receptors back there have to be surrounded by fluid. And so to keep uh, the olfactory receptors working in the desert, they have to be very, very well protected. And that protective uh, surroundings made it very difficult to make these recordings until recently. And so uh, my postdoc, Barani Rahman, made these SCM images of the antenna. Here's the antenna. When you zoom in, you see there are these little spines sticking out of them. Um, and when you zoom in, these are, these are called sensilla. And when you zoom in even further, you can see there are these tiny little pores in the spine. And those were, are what the odorants pass through. And these are really well designed. The size of the pore is just small enough to prevent dust from getting in and out, and, and just large enough to allow odorant molecules to pass back and forth. So when you record from them, what does it look like? Well, there's usually some spontaneous activity going on, and it, it's true spontaneous activity. It's not because of ambient odorants in the environment that we're not controlling. Uh, we've, we've done some studies of this work. There's always, the, these, these receptors are spontaneously active, which raises this very interesting question about noise in the system that I, that I, I won't have time to talk about today. Uh, but that's another aspect to understanding sensory systems. They're always a little bit noisy. But when you present an odor, you can see these, these strong bursting patterns of activity. 
And so we presented different pattern, different odorants, always a single pulse of odor, uh, to different receptors, changing the identity of the odor, looking at different receptors. And one thing we noticed is that there can be small differences in the timing of the responses, just in the receptors themselves. Uh, here, for example, is a, a long burst of spikes. Uh, here, the response is actually a period of inhibition in, in the receptors. And that, that, that surprised me, that the olfactory receptors are actually being inhibited by some odorants. Um, in some cases, the response is very brief. And if you extend out the odor into a, a longer period of time, here it's four seconds, you can see that these changes in, in timing are, uh, can be quite dramatic. So here there's a very long response, um, long bursting response, followed by a little bit of inhibition. Uh, here you can see that the responses can vary in duration. Inhibition is actually quite common in these responses. And from time to time, uh, you can see very long responses. It looks like uh, this cell is more spontaneously active, but that's not really the case. It's actually that the off response lasts for so long that it wraps around. Um, so this, this cell is continuing to respond for many seconds after the odorant is turned off. So there's a lot of timing in, in the responses of these receptors. They're not, I, I have to say, what I expected to see is that the receptors would burst when the odor was present and they would stop bursting when the odor wasn't there. But the timing is more, more interesting than that. And we started to think, is this the missing piece? Is this, is this uh, helping to drive the patterning that we see in the responses of the projection neurons? Oh, I, I should also mention that when you step back and look at large numbers of receptor neurons, they show the same sort of population dynamics that we see downstream in, in the projection neurons. So I, I talked about the baseline period, I talked about the fixed point, I talked about the way different odorants will go off into different directions uh, in the response space. You see all of that just in the responses of the receptors alone. Uh, here's an example looking at different concentrations, and you can see again higher concentrations go further out, lower concentrations don't go quite as far. So it's starting to look like a lot of the timing information that we see in, in the receptor, in, in the downstream, in the projection neurons, is actually coming from the periphery. We wanted to test this idea rigorously, uh, that the missing piece in understanding the responses of the PNs is to understand what, what's coming out of the receptor neurons. So to do this, we made a, a two-part computational model. Um, it, it was actually very, very simple. Uh, the first part was just a really simple simulation of the receptor neurons. And then we fed this simple simulation uh, into a simple model of the antennal lobe. And this model of the antenna lobe uh, just simulated the responses of projection neurons in, in the numbers that we know exist and the local neurons and with their appropriate conductances and, and interconnectivity. So first, we simulated the receptor neuron response properties. Um, we measured the different latencies that we had seen in vivo, uh, the different rise time, different fall time, different amount of adaptation, uh, the different changes in amplitude that we had seen. Uh, and we took all of these parameters that we had actually measured in, in, in live animals and then uh, distributed them across a large population of, of, of fake receptor neurons. Um, and then we tested to see if, if this population of fake receptor neurons actually responded the way real ones do. And so we looked at the way they responded to uh, simulated low concentrations, high concentrations, and, and, and changes in, in odorant. And the responses that we saw in our fake neurons looked like responses that we see in our real neurons. So that's, that's good, they were supposed to do that. Um, but then we also stepped back and looked at the, the population response. Uh, we made electroantennagram recordings from the locust. And to do that, you just take a, electrodes and place it on either side of the antenna, and it gives you a, basically an average response of all the receptors that are in the antenna. And it looks like this blue line here. Um, and then we just added up all of the responses in our fake receptor population, and we saw that for different uh, durations of odor, uh, the responses of the populations also matched. So the individual uh, receptors are working as they should, and the population is working the way it should. And we also looked at the dynamical responses of them, and again, we saw the same fixed points, the same rest points, the same excursion properties that we had seen in, in vivo. And again, you know, this is what it should do. This was just a way of checking that, and it does. Excuse me. And so, then we took this population of receptor neurons and we fed them into our model of the antenna lobe. And the nice thing about having fake receptor neurons is that you can, uh, you can change their properties in ways that you can't do in vivo, and that's what allowed us to do the, the tests that we wanted to do. So, for example, when we provided our model of the antenna lobe with the full complement of variety in amplitude and in timing that we see 
in vivo in the receptors, we then looked at the responses of the projection neurons in the model, and it, according to many different measures, they looked pretty much like what we see in vivo. So they had a, a whole variety of different timings. Uh, the timing was complex by different measures. Basically, they, they looked like what we had seen in vivo. When we then restricted our population of, of fake receptor neurons so that they could vary in amplitude, but they couldn't vary in timing, then the responses, all, the responses of the projection neurons all looked basically look like what we saw when we gave the electrical shock to the antenna. All of the temporal complexity was gone from the projection neurons. And, I mean, compare this to this. And then when we took our fake receptor population and we gave the full complement of timing variety, but we restricted the amplitude to one height, that didn't seem to have any effect on it. The responses to this, uh, this population of projection neurons looked very much like what we had seen uh, in, in the intact version. So this suggests that heterogeneity in the timing of the response um, is really critical uh, to giving uh, the timing that we see downstream in the projection neurons. Now we wanted to test this in vivo. Uh, it, how can we test this idea that variations in the timing of the projection neuron response are, what are responsible for variations in, in the timing of the projection neurons? How can we test that? And then we realize, ah, the fixed point. If you give an odorant for a long enough period of time, the response will settle, the response of the receptor neurons will settle into this fixed point where they are no longer dynamically varying in their timing. They're either locked up or they're locked down. There's no more t variation in, in their timing. And that's what we needed to be able to test the importance of the variation in timing. So we did an experiment where we made simultaneous recordings from receptor neurons in the antenna and intracellular recordings from projection neurons. And first we gave very brief odor pulses. And remember the brief odor pulse doesn't give rise to a fixed point at all. You only have the transient onset and, and offset responses. And what we saw in that case is that, um, and the measurement here is the velocity of the movement of the trajectory. Uh, so when the trajectory is moving quickly through the response space in, in the receptor neurons, it is, it's also with exactly matching timing moving very quickly through the response space in the projection neurons. Now what happens if we give a long pulse where, the, where a fixed point will settle? Well, what happens uh, as you might predict based on, on, on our uh, simulation results, is that as soon as the response settles into a fixed point in the receptor neurons, all the dynamic variation drops out of the, the projection neuron response as well. And then when the response picks up again in the offset response of the receptor neurons, then there's another burst of dynamic activity in the projection neurons. So this confirms the prediction of the computational model. This was the missing piece. The antenna lobe takes the dynamic information that it's getting from the receptors and then elaborates upon them. The responses of the, of the receptor neurons are never as complicated as what you see in the antenna lobe. You never see these very long, complicated sequences of excitation and inhibition. But to get those complicated sequences of excitation and inhibition from the circuitry, you require temporal variation in the input. So I've been going on and on and on about the sense of smell. Uh, what about the sense of taste? Um, I'd just like to mention some very new experiments. Th these are unpublished results that we've just started to do in the laboratory. Um, and uh, I, I think it's interesting to compare the two systems. So we wanted to deliver the olfactory, the, the taste stimuli in the same way that we've been delivering the odor stimuli all these years. Uh, and that is with very precise attention to the timing of the stimulus. Um, and it's hard to control the precise timing of, of a taste in. Uh, that's something that you can think about as you're having dinner later on. Um, but we, we came up with a way to do it. And we decided to use the moth for these experiments. And the reason that we're using the moth is that the proboscis is just so incredibly long. Um, it's like shockingly long. Um, so you can take the proboscis of the moth and thread it into a tube and then just with a series of pumps <laughs> drive a constant flow of clean water over the proboscis and then inject a little bolus of tastin into that, that flow of clean water and we put a little bit of food coloring into the tastin so we could monitor with a color sensor we know exactly when that bolus of tastin is passing over the proboscis just like that <laughs> and the output of the color monitor looks like that so we can see uh, when we know we know the timing, which is, which is important, and that that's something new in in this particular analysis. So what do we see? 
Um, let me first mention something very briefly about the gustatory anatomy of the moth. Um, here's the animal's head, obviously. Here's the proboscis. Uh, inside the head, this is what it looks like in, in a, under the microscope. Those are the eyes. Here's the proboscis. And there's a little window cut open here, and that's the brain. A lot of people don't think insects have brains, but they do. And, and there it is. These are electrodes t sticking into the brain. Here's the ground wire. Um, and so here's a, a schematic of, uh, of this, this brain structure. So the pro information from the proboscis is carried by the maxillary nerve. The maxillary nerve goes into the subesophageal ganglion. And then there's a bunch of interneurons here uh, that un until, until now haven't been characterized. Uh, here's the maxillary nerve. Um, so we found that by putting an electrode into the maxillary nerve, we can fill uh, and then record from uh, the receptor neurons in the proboscis. And here's how they respond to pulses of, of tastin. Here's the uh, readout of the color sensor so you know where the tastin is passing over. And we used all different tastins. These are things that are salty or uh, caffeine, um, sugary things, uh, other types of chemicals. And a given receptor neuron will respond to many different things. It's like in the olfactory system. Uh, it's not like there's a salt receptor. Uh, like there, these receptors will respond to many different things. And they'll respond with different timing. Um, again, this is the, the exact same timing of the stimulus, it's just the timing of the response that varies. So this, I, I think, is the first indication that the, the, the gustatory system in the periphery is, is concerned with timing. And it's generating its own timing response. It's not merely following the timing of the stimulus. So that's in the receptor neurons on, on the proboscis. Uh, we've also recorded from the local neurons um, these are analogous to the local neurons in the olfactory system. They're receiving direct input from the receptor neurons. Um, and how do these cells respond? Well, they also respond with complicated timing. Um, and the timing is more complicated than what we see in the receptors. So here, for example, is a cell that's responding. Uh, it doesn't respond just to water alone. Um, if you give a, a salty solution, this is how it responds, a burst of spikes. And the response is very reliable. Trial after trial, it looks just like that. And if you apply sugar instead of salt, uh, first there's a period of inhibition and then there's a, a, a burst of spikes. Uh, so we're beginning to see analogies between the gustatory system and the olfactory system. Um, you can even look at the responses and, and plot the same sort of dynamical response across the population. Uh, and you see the same features. You see bouncing around in the baseline. You see different taste uh, going off in different directions of the response space. You see depending on the concentration, different excursion length. It, it really seems that these two systems are, are handling information in, in a similar fashion. And I, I think this is going to surprise a lot of people. You even see oscillations. If you put a field potential electrode into the subesophageal ganglion, you see the same type of oscillatory response. And I, I believe this is the first time uh, anyone has, has observed oscillations in a gustatory system. Uh, the oscillations are at about 40 hertz. Um, here you can see the peak is at about 40 hertz. When you have no tastent, the, there's no, no peak. You, you only see that peak when the tastent is present. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, the timing of the responses of the receptor neurons and the local neurons uh, is synchronized to the responses of the oscillations. It's just like what we saw in the olfactory system. Uh, this is a sliding window cross-correlation diagram, and this banding pattern shows you uh, that the responses have become synchronized during the time of the odor presentation. And so we see that both where the spikes occur and also just looking at the oscillations in, in the membrane potential of the cell. So it looks like there are strong homologies between the two systems. Uh, and, and this is new. In, in one sense, it's not surprising, because the two systems are dealing with similar data sets, very high dimensional data sets. Maybe this is the best way for brains to handle high dimensional data sets. So to come back to the start, uh, how do we bring the outside world inside? Uh, what form does the information take? Well, in both of these systems, it appears to be changing formats at different points along, along the sensory pathway of spatially distributed spiking. Distributed meaning large numbers of cells are participating in the response to every stimulus and that they're distributed uh, across uh, the, the cells that are responding and also across time. Uh, timing is an important component of the response. And what mechanisms are determining the format of the information? They're interactions that occur across multiple layers of neurons and these interactions critically begin with the receptors themselves. I'd like to acknowledge 
uh, three people whose work I was talking mostly about today. Uh, Joby Joseph and Barani Rahman uh, did the analysis of uh, under, uh, activity that underlies the generation of, of patterning in the cells. Uh, Joby now has his own lab in Hyderabad, and Barani now has his own lab at WashU. And Sam Ryder is a, a graduate student in my lab. He's affiliated with Brown University, and he's now doing the new experiments on, on gustation. So thank you very much.